Well, in general, you are not having a good day when your name appears on a lawsuit. Thankfully, our speaker this afternoon, Mark Janis, embraced the challenge of suing one of the most powerful political forces in the country, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Government Union. Mark, while serving as a child support specialist in the state of Illinois, courageously fought in the courts to restore not only his own First Amendment rights, but the constitutional rights of five million public employees all across our nation. You see, Mark merely wanted to do his job well, ensuring that children got the resources that they needed. But ask me, merely wanted Mark to just shut up and pay his union dues. Mark instead decided to fight, and he took his case, Janice v. AFSCME, all the way to the United States Supreme Court and won. Indeed, Mark's victory resulted in the single greatest First Amendment rights case in a generation. Today, Mark is now serving as a senior fellow at the Liberty Justice Center in Illinois, and he is spreading the message of worker freedom through his personal story. So please join me in giving a warm Pennsylvania welcome to a First Amendment hero, Mark Janis. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. You know, it, it's a bit surreal, you know, to be here with all of you, um, you know, because seeing all of you people here as, as uh, you know, champions of liberty, you know, in this great country of ours. Um, and I'd like to thank Loman, you know, for inviting me to attend and give me the opportunity to, to speak with all of you and kind of tell you a little bit about my story. Um, you know, the entire experience over the last three, four years has been quite surreal, quite frankly, um, because I never set out to be a Supreme Court plaintiff. I mean, that kind of was not what I thought was going to happen, quite frankly. Um, I mean, let's face it, to take on government unions, you know, some of the most politically powerful interests in this country, am I nuts? But, you know, I'm just, I'm just a you know, regular guy, and I still live in Springfield, Illinois, our state capital. Yes, Springfield is a capital, not Chicago. And for those of you who don't know about Illinois politics, <clears throat> excuse me, politics, see, I even choke up when I mention politics. Um, something, you know, Springfield is, is a very, very strong union town, and Illinois is a very, very strong union state. So, like a lot of people in Springfield area, you know, we work sometimes in the public sector and we do sometimes work in the private sector. Um, but in the 80s, I worked for state government, spent about six years in their economic development arm. And at the time, I didn't have to pay union dues. It wasn't required and really knew nothing about the unions, quite frankly. But after a few years, I left the government and went into the private sector you know, and did what a lot of people did, you know, trying to, you know, make things better and employ people and so on. But then in 2007, I returned to state government and I became a child support specialist. Now, a child support specialist is just merely somebody that tries to help the two parties in any disagreement when it comes to the children, such as divorce and separation and custody, and we're just trying to make sure that both parties, you know, get what they deserve from the standpoint of what the court order says. But I also realized that something had really changed. And what led me to that was the fact that when I got my first paycheck, I had this line item deduction called union dues. Union dues. And so I started asking around and went to a lot of my peers, and they basically said, oh yeah, everybody has to pay. If you don't pay, you don't have a job. You can't work here. And that's when I learned that Illinois politicians 
had granted government unions the ability you know, to deduct money from almost every state worker in the state of Illinois. It was state law. You had to pay. And I never signed a union pledge card. I never signed up for the union. During the entire HR intake, nothing was ever said about a union. It wasn't raised, it wasn't talked about, but yet, look what happened to me. So every year, as, as I continued my uh, career in the state, um, you know, this money just kept coming out, you know, month after month, year after year. You know, and I really didn't want to pay a political organization to do my job. I kind of felt I could do okay by myself. Um, but what am I going to do? You know, I'm just a single guy. And my frustration reached a boiling point when one year the union threatened strike. That's right, they threatened strike. If the state didn't hand over about three billion, yes, that's with a B, in increased wages and benefits. Now, why would that make me so upset? I mean, who wouldn't want to raise, right? That, that would be pretty good. Raise is not bad. Well, if you know anything about Illinois, you've probably heard the state of Illinois is broke. Not just a little, a lot. And in fact, they're so broke that their bond rating is nearing junk status. Wow, isn't that an indictment you know, against our system? You know, they can't afford day-to-day -day operations, but yet here's the union asking for three billion in additional wages and benefits. And to think that AFSCME wanted guys like me and my fellow workers to go out on strike to get these increased benefits and these wages. Well, I had, you know, I just, I felt that I had to do something. I mean, this just, just got to stop. This, this railroad is just rolling down the tracks and it's just not doing anybody any good. But, you know, I couldn't do it all by myself. I mean, here again, we've got this massive public sector union that has about 35,000 people on their rolls, both fair share and non-fair share alike. So I met the folks at the Liberty Justice Center, and they're a public interest law firm, and, you know, they fight for individual liberties. And they fight, they're not interested in fighting for money, they're fighting more for the cause and people's individual liberty and their freedoms. So we started to talk to them. In fact, there's a lady here in the room right now that I talked to. Christina, can you kind of give a wave? Christina's actually my hero. She's the one that, that really helped me to understand the help, you know, that I could get from Liberty Justice. So we asked Liberty Justice to, to file my case in 2015, and they did. They also asked the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation to join us because they had also argued before the Supreme Court before in the Harris v. Quinn case. Um, and they eventually ruled in our favor in June 2018, which enacted right to work over the entire public sector for all 50 states. I mean, think about that. I mean, we're talking approximately five and a half million public sector workers. Five and a half million. So after the, the ruling, I went back to my job at the state, and I eventually told my mother what was going on, you know, because I was a little bit afraid of what might happen. And you know what she said? Oh, Mark, you know what they do to Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> But it, it also, after the ruling, you know, kind of dawned on me that, um, you know, this, this ruling, even though we won the case and we got the ruling, um, the fight's not over. You know, we're, we're still having to fight this fight. Um, unions aren't going to go away. They're not going to pack up and leave town. Um, 
they want to continue this monopoly that they have. And so I retired from my job at the state, um, and I joined the Liberty Justice Center and also the Illinois Policy Institute and uh, to advocate for worker rights full time. And because of this ruling, we started to hear from people all across the country. They were trying to exercise their Janus rights. Wow. Did you ever think, did you ever have the feeling that you've never wanted to become a noun, a verb, and an adjective? <laughs> I'm still uncomfortable with a lot of this. But um, the problem is we have a lot of unions and politicians that are standing in people's way, preventing them from exercising their rights under the Constitution, their freedom of speech and their freedom of association. Now, let me tell you about some of the people that we're helping. Um, Shalay Oliver is an income maintenance caseworker for Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. She joined that organization in 2014. And what she does, she helps a variety of people, uh, the under or unemployed, uh, she helps the disabled, and other vulnerable populations in Philadelphia. Um, she's a Philadelphia neighbor, I'm sorry, um, Philadelphia native, sorry. And she just believes in service to the, to the area. I mean, you know, I think very, very commendable. However, she was forced to pay SEIU, one of the government unions, in order to work for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And when she heard about the Janus decision, she thought she'd be able to resign, you know, and save herself about $500 a year. But guess what? Despite the Janus decision, there it is again. They kept pulling money out of her paycheck for six months after her resignation. And after multiple attempts to try to stop this, which continued to fall on deaf ears, she finally, she contacted us and we're filing a case. We're having to go to court against the union and the Commonwealth. Does that seem absurd or what? really does. We've got four mental health workers in Lebanon County who tried for months to quit their union and get out. Teamsters Local 429. And just weeks after the decision, they sent, the four of them sent letters asking to resign. But they soon learned that they couldn't do it. They had this arbitrary opt-out window that you can only resign and get out during certain periods. Now, how would you like it if you found out that you could only exercise your, your constitutional rights only during certain periods of the year? Does that make sense? I don't think so. Sorry, you have to wait till two years from now to exercise your First Amendment rights. Rest of the time, you're stuck with us just doesn't work. So we filed a, a lawsuit called Adams versus Teamsters. And um, we filed that last February, and we're still in the litigation process. But it's very, very clear to me and to many others across the country that unions are fighting to maintain their membership in any way they can. Any way they can. They'll step on your toes, they'll ignore your rights, they'll simply ignore you. We had one person that contact us that followed all the rules and regulations the union laid out to opt out, and they said, oh, send us this letter, it's gotta have this language, and you send it to a certified mail, and we'll take care of it. So he did all that. Guess what? His certified letter came back unclaimed. So he called the union, he said, hey, what about my resignation? Oh, we never got your letter. How, if you don't send us the letter, we, we can't help you. 
well, if you don't claim the letter, how can you, you know, I mean, it's just absurd, totally absurd, you know. But we've also heard from um, school cafeteria workers in New Jersey. In that case, those people went to a meeting to learn about the union that the union was putting on, and all they did was sign a card that said, we want more information. They weren't signing up for the union, they just wanted information. Guess what? They're now members. They didn't ask to be a member, they didn't sign up to be a member, and so now they're stuck. You know, we have government workers in Maryland and Washington that have contacted us saying that the union told them they could get out. Not a problem. They even promised to refund their dues. No refund has ever come out and they're still paying. I mean, the, folks, these are just some of the tactics that these people are using to continue their monopoly power and to continue draining the wallets of public workers. Now, you've probably heard that I am anti-union and I'm anti-collective bargaining. No, I'm not. If you want the freedom to join a union or to not join a union, that's the only thing that my case was brought for. Give the worker the choice. That's all, just the choice. Let the worker decide for themselves what is best for them, not some not some arbitrary person somewhere in wherever that says, oh no, you have to do this or you have to do that and make decisions for you. Don't you think we all have the right to make our own decisions? I think that's basic. I mean, let's face it, the Constitution is what governs this great country of ours. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of people out there that think it's merely a suggestion. Think about that. It's a lot of people think that the Constitution is a suggestion. I beg to differ. I really do. I really do. But to kind of conclude, you know, I, I just want to say that, you know, as a group, uh, with all the entities that we have across you know, the, the, this great country, we have to decide for ourselves what is best. We have to stand up for our rights, and we have to stand up for worker rights for those individuals and let them know they have rights. There are cases all over the country where unions aren't even mentioning the fact that you do not have to join a union. In fact, if you're in California, they had legislation they passed that said an employer, a government employer, cannot even talk to the employee about their rights. Because if they do, that's considered, goes against the law and that employer could be fined. Call it a gag order, if you will. We're fighting that also. I mean, it's just, it, it's just almost ridiculous. But I want to thank everybody here for, you know, for the fine hospitality Pennsylvania provides. Um, looking forward to meeting some of you if, if the opportunity arises. And uh, if you have questions, uh, please stop me. I'm more than happy to try to answer any questions for you. Uh, probably see you out and around. Um, but again, thank you. Thank you to Loman and everyone else. And I very much appreciate being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>